Where to incorporate? What are the considerations? Corporations are formed by filing articles of incorporation with the Secretary of State in the state where you want to form the entity. Um, every state has its own regimen for filing articles of incorporation. Um, we talked about why uh, a, a, a business might want to pick one jurisdiction over another. Um, costs of incorporation may be a driver. Uh, sophistication of, of courts may be a driver. Uh, we talked about the concept of statutory agent fees as a possible factor. Uh, we talked about the fact that franchise taxes uh, may drive the decision to incorporate in a certain state uh, and that th this is a tax on the right to be a corporation. It doesn't have to do with operating an actual franchise like a McDonald's, for instance. In Ohio, we have the commercial activity tax, which covers that concept of a, a franchise tax. Um, 1701.04 in Ohio provides for the filing of articles of incorporation and 1701.05 talks about the choice of a name for that entity, which is an important decision. Um, there needs to be a purpose clause in every set of articles of incorporation. In Ohio, we have a fairly uh, skeletal articles of organization template, articles of incorporation template, but we looked at the statute that says that parties are free to supplement that skeletal template uh, to, add, to address any of a large number of issues. And throughout the semester already, we've looked at at least a half a dozen instances where one might want to supplement that skeletal articles of incorporation to include different provisions. Um, we talked about the role of a statutory agent, which is essentially the mail drop, uh, warm body mail drop for a corporation, which is, of course, an artificial entity. Uh, we talked about the role of the incorporator as forming the entity. We talked about the initial shares that a corporation is authorized to issue and how they have to be authorized by law to issue those. Uh, we touched on the concepts of par value, which is a floor value for the shares. Um, we talked about uh, the adoption um, by the shareholders once the entity is formed of uh, bylaws called a code of regulation in Ohio and how that provides or that, that governs much of the internal corporate governance uh, procedures such as uh, conduct of shareholder meetings, director meetings, election of officers, uh, voting rights, quorum, use of proxies, etc. Section 1701.11 spells out some of the provisions that can be in bylaws. We then talked about <coughs> the ultra vires doctrine, uh, once page 181 of the text, which talks about the concept of corporations um, being authorized to act within their uh, stated purpose and not beyond that. If they do act beyond that, it's considered ultra vires, and arguably the corporation doesn't have any right to act that way. However, in Ohio, 1701.13H is the provision that we have that deals with the concept of ultra vires, who can assert it, when it can be inserted. We've looked at some cases that dealt with that. We looked at the closely held corporation statute, 1701.591. This is a special, purpose, special purpose statute which allows a corporation to elect to be uh, treated as a closely held corporation, thereby avoiding some of the uh, corporate formalities otherwise required of regular corporations in Ohio, whether they're closed corporations or public corporations. That is, obviates the need for uh, annual shareholder meeting, obviates the need for directors, etc. But there are specific provisions that have to be met in order for a corporation to be able to enjoy the status of being an official Ohio closely held corporation. What happens if the corporation starts business before it's actually formed? Um, we looked at that concept uh, and the fact that there's liability for all of the actors to the extent they begin to do business before the corporation has legally been formed. We have a statute in Ohio that deals with that 1701.04D that deals with the fact that the legal existence begins upon the filing of the articles of, of, articles of incorporation, etc.
Having spent time determining how a corporation is set up, we then spent a class talking about disregard of the corporate entity. Um, in what circumstances can a plaintiff ignore the fact that a corporation and all of its nice protections um, has been formed? Uh, are there ever instances when equitable principles uh, allow a plaintiff to pierce the corporate veil and uh, cause liability to uh, rest upon the individual owners of a corporation. This is a common law doctrine in Ohio. There's no statute. Um, it is an equitable concept uh, that uh, is an, a common law device to provide a remedy for a uh, plaintiff who otherwise would uh, be limited in its remedy to the corporation. Uh, you might say, well, that is the point of a corporation, and it is, but these cases looked at instances in which uh, the law has developed uh, justification for ignoring that corporate form in certain instances. In what circumstances will a court uh, consider piercing the corporate veil? One of the con first concepts we looked at is the alter ego concept, meaning that the shareholders of the corporation and the corporation itself are virtually indistinguishable. This may mean they have the same bank account number, they may have the same address, they may operate exactly the same way, um, and there may be identity, uh, it might, might be um, uh, overlap of identities throughout the whole organization. Another factor that courts look at is undercapitalization. As the corporation so underfunded, purposely underfunded, that a plaintiff could not possibly enjoy any kind of remedy. Um, that will be a, a, a justification for piercing in some instances. Um, lack of corporate formalities. Um, if the corporation doesn't uh, document any of its corporate proceedings, there's not much else to prove that it's a corporation because it's already a fictitious entity and that fiction is created by the records that are created. Um, if those records and formalities aren't documented, this is an item of evidence to suggest that there is uh, not a real corporation. Um, the landmark case in Ohio that we have dealing with this is Belvedere Condominium Association versus Rourke that came up with a three-pronged test for piercing the corporate veil. Um, one, um, are there a lack of formalities or otherwise a uh, unity of identity such that the alter ego concept uh, applies? Has there been, number two, has there been some sort of wrongful action or a legal action? And number three, has harm resulted to the plaintiff? We found that that um, <clears throat> Second prong was uh, clarified in the Dombrowski versus Wellpoint case, where the test after Dombrowski is um, again: is there that unity of identity such that um, the corporation is the alter ego of the shareholder? Number two, however, um, has the uh, corporation been used? not to necessarily commit an illegal act, but um, uh, to commit an unjust or inequitable act. What the, what the Dombrowski court ended up finding was that um, they, the second prong was modified to say that, um, the Belvedere second prong was, was um, modified to say that uh, domination and control of the corporation was used to commit fraud, an illegal act, or a similarly unlawful act. Um, we're not sure what that means. Um, that is for the cases to determine. Um, but let's. Su I'm suggesting that Dombrowski case slightly broadened that second point to go from something illegal uh, to something that um, uh, illegal or similarly unlawful. Not sure what that means. We talked about successor liability. 
and that the general concept is that successors aren't responsible for the liabilities of their predecessors, except in certain specific situations, merger transactions, or, or where one company or person buys the shares of another company, in which and they therefore buy all of the uh, liabilities and assets of that company. Um, another uh, situation where a successor might take on the liabilities of a predecessor is where a company agrees to buy the assets of another company and agrees expressly to assume that predecessor's liabilities. Um, but there's also a legal concept uh, that we studied a little bit um, that talked about um, the idea of uh, a product line exception to non-liability. That is, if uh, you buy a company that is engaged in the same business and you hire the same people and you are essentially the same entity except for ownership at the very top level, then arguably that new entity is responsible for the liabilities of the predecessor. In other words, the predecessor's um, legal existence is disregarded for purposes of assessing liability. Uh, that came out of, of, of the Colorado, I'm sorry, the uh, um, some California cases. Um, and we saw the Flower versus Cone Automatic Machine Company in Ohio that struggled with this issue and um, came down on the side of Ohio not adopting this product line exception to non-liability, uh, taking the position that this needs to be uh, legislated if it's going to become law in Ohio. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about financial matters in the corporation. Um, we're going to talk about, we're going to move now into talking about public financing, and that is capitalization uh, obtained through the public stock markets. Uh, we talked about initial public offerings. These are where a uh, company um, is able to access the public capital markets. Uh, by listing their shares on the stock market and all of a sudden being able to sell them to uh, a wider, uh, wider uh, variety of, of investors than in a close corporation. The fact that um, this creates liquidity for the corporation, allows them to attract better investors, better customers, better credit worthiness, but that it, the attendant uh, burden is that of copious disclosure. Uh, we talked about the concept of uh, blue sky laws, which are state securities laws that regulate uh, what corporations must disclose to investors before they'll, they're able to take their money in uh, for buying shares. Uh, we looked at 1707 of the Ohio Revised Code, which is Ohio's state securities law. Uh, we talked about the Securities Act of 1933, which is the primary federal law regulating distribution of securities uh, and registering of securities with the SEC. Uh, we talked about the fact that that um, registration regimen um, encompasses uh, two sets of regulations under the 1933 Act, one being Regulation SK, which uh, s provides guidance and copious detail on the format for these uh, securities filings and Regulation SX, the detailed accounting rules, since after all, we're talking about financial matters here. We also talked about the Securities Act of 1934, which established the Securities and Exchange Commission and which provides for regular, continuous disclosure once a corporation has publicly registered its shares under the 1933 Act. There are certain exemptions from the requirement of registration, which by the way, registration is required when you're engaged in interstate commerce and when you have uh, over a certain number of shareholders uh, in, in the company. There are exemptions from registration uh, for uh, certain types of transactions, the most prominent one being the exemption from registration for what are considered to be private offerings. 
Uh, we talked a little bit about what it means for an, off an offering to be a private offering. Um, the uh, motivation behind these rules is clearly investor protection, and that can kick in um, even for a company not traded if it has a significant number of shareholders who are relatively unsophisticated. Section 4.2 of the Securities Act, I'm sorry, 4 paren 2 paren of the Securities Act uh, provides this exemption for private offerings. Um, we looked at a specific set of regulations under the 33 Act uh, called the uh, uh, Regulation D. Regulation D is a what we call safe harbor set of rules that allows a corporation to offer its shares in interstate commerce without registering it pursuant to the 33 Act if um, it meets certain requirements and complies with certain rules that are set forth in the, in the in Regulation D. Uh, we walked through Regulation D in some detail. Uh, again, this is where we first used the Security Lawyer's Desk Book, which contains all of the statutes and all of the regulations under all the federal securities laws. To determine what is a security, we looked at the SEC versus W.J. Howey case, uh, the uh, case on page 321 of the text, which provided a definition for what is a security. Essentially, it's an investment of money in a common enterprise with profits solely from the efforts of others, and how that's still a good test today. We then touched on a number of concepts, <coughs> state law concepts. Um, that were um, implicated in, in, in some cases uh, where there were uh, publicly traded shares. One of them was the Stokes versus Continental Trust case that provided us for the first time with exposure to the concept of preemptive rights. That is, the right of a shareholder to uh, purchase that shareholder's pro rata interest of newly issued shares of a corporation. The idea being here that that right is important in order to avoid dilution of the investor's relative proportion of ownership uh, in a particular entity. Preemptive rights in Ohio are addressed by statute in 1701.15. This is one of those provisions that must make its way into the Articles of Incorporation if it's going to be triggered. We then looked at uh, the Lacos Land Company versus Arden Group. Um, <clears throat> for the proposition that even though directors are allowed to determine how the corporation is capitalized generally, um, that cannot be uh, carried out in a way that's going to um, constitute an abuse of power um, by the majority shareholder or the directors. Uh, the concept being that uh, shareholder directors have a certain fiduciary duty um, to other shareholders in determining how to capitalize the corporation. Uh, they don't have unlimited discretion to make those decisions. We looked at the uh, Dodge versus Ford case, um, the idea that um, the property theory of share ownership uh, sometimes wins out over social welfare theory. This is the case where Ford suspended its policy of annually, annually reducing the selling price of its cars uh, because uh, they wanted to expand uh, the business and uh, use some of that. Uh, they were going to suspend their, their dividend and um, I'm sorry, they, they, they were going to suspend their, their annual policy of, re of reducing the selling price for cars. And um, the idea here was uh, they were going to focus more on um, buying some new equipment. They didn't, they didn't need, need as much revenue. Um, they wanted to make the car cheaper so people could afford it, and the shareholders uh, argued that this was uh, considered an uh, abuse of the shareholders' property rights in their shares. So this is the case, one of the first cases where we have the concept of the business judgment rule coming into play. Under this idea, the directors are given uh, uh, the presumption of acting in the best interests of the corporation. Um, unless they are acting uh, in an arbitrary fashion. Um, the, the upshot of the Ford case, Dodge versus Ford case, was that um, 
the directors had a duty uh, to distribute money that they were sitting on. Um, rather unusual case, but we looked at it because it uh, addresses, again, for the first time, the business judgment rule, but also the concept of property ownership theory as it applies to share ownership. That is, that shareholders will sometimes assert um, rights as owners of the business, uh, which they technically are. They, they, own, they own shares, but they, they technically own parts of the business as well. This week we talk about management and control of the corporation, uh, the principal players, how are they elected, what are they supposed to do, how do they get removed, what laws govern uh, their activities. Directors are the top level decision makers, the top level operators of corporations management. Um, we looked at, after looking at some uh, cases from other jurisdictions, we looked at 1701.59, which uh, provides expressly for what the authority of directors are in Ohio. We also pointed out that <clears throat> the authority of uh, corporate directors is uh, typically spelled out in the Code of Regulations, and that uh, sometimes those regulations parrot the language of 1701.59, but they often contain provisions in addition to 1701.59. An interesting issue we looked at in some of the cases was <clears throat> uh, the impact of a close corporation arrangement on the traditional role of directors. Um, remember in Ohio, the close corporation statute allows a, uh, a company to expressly uh, remove the requirement of directors uh, or meetings of directors. Um, we saw in some other jurisdictions how uh, close corporations that perhaps didn't have as, as an express a provision as Ohio um, were um, uh, uh, treating corporations, uh, directors as uh, being uh, relatively powerless. And we looked at how the court uh, struggled with uh, reconciling close corporation treatment with the traditional roles of, of directors under general corporation statutes. Um, we looked at the uh, Zion versus Kurtz case and the Auer versus Dressel stockholders, uh, Dressel stockholder uh, case. When it comes to, ma comes to management of the corporation, <clears throat> this is where we really often have an opportunity to uh, look at the bylaws and what they provide for um, look at a statute to see what it, how it might impact the role of management, and also look at any agreement between the owners, any shareholder agreement, that might also include provisions for how the managers are supposed to manage the corporation. Moving on to talk about shareholder matters, how do shares get issued? Um, we talked about the mechanics of how that happens. Um, we looked at actual uh, share ledgers uh, shareholder ledgers, certificates of share of, of, of shares. Um, we talked about the concept of record date, uh, 1701.45, uh, dealing with uh, a measuring point for determining who are the shareholders. Uh, we got into the concept of beneficial ownership versus record ownership. Record ownership being exactly what it sounds like, who is the shareholder of record, beneficial ownership being uh, who actually has the rights in those shares. Uh, uh, and we looked at 1701.28, uh, uh, which uh, addresses, or at least provides guidance for Ohio corporations as to who they're supposed to um, interact with when it comes to sharehold shares that may be owned uh, of record by one entity and beneficially by others. We, then we went into a discussion of annual meeting of shareholders. Um, this is one of those mechanisms that's kind of the most basic of shareholder uh, provisions unless you're a close corporation. And we looked at 1701.39, which provides uh, for the existence of an annual meeting in Ohio. Uh, we looked at the notice provision, 1701.41, uh, uh, and we looked at that notice provision in detail uh, because this tends to be an area of dispute, at least in closely held corporations. We then looked at the concept of proxies. Uh, 
and um, what is a proxy? It's uh, you giving your vote to someone else. How is that regulated? And we looked at 1701.48, uh, which deals with uh, the mechanics of, of granting a proxy under the Ohio Corporation Law. Then we touched on for the first time the concept of quorum, uh, that is the requisite number of votes available to, to carry or to vote on any particular issue. Uh, we looked at 1701.51. Um, as to the conduct of the meeting itself, we noted that Ohio does not have a statute, but we did look at MBCA 7.08, which is a more detailed uh, um, listing of the types of uh, an itinerary or a, uh, uh, an agenda for, for a shareholder meeting. And we then moved into the concepts of cumulative versus straight voting on 393, and of course this only applies to voting for directors. Um, you take the number of shares you have, you multiply it times the number of candidates to be elected, and you can spread those votes however you like uh, against the um, uh, seats that are up for election. 1701.55 is our statute. Again, uh, shareholders are allowed to accumulate their shares unless the articles say no. Um, and we talked about the fact that this is yet another one of those one of those provisions that you need to put into your articles of incorporation. Finally, we looked at the uh, Humphreys versus Winnes case, uh, an Ohio case where we dealt with the um, interplay between cumulative voting and a classified board and how they might impact each other. Classified board being a board of directors in which only a portion of the board is elected in any given year. Um, there are classes of directors uh, and the idea being here that it, all directors can't be replaced or voted out in one year. It can only be done uh, when that particular class of directors is up for election. Classified board of directors has to be built into the uh, code of regulations. Um, if there's going to be an elimination of the classified board, um, it has to be an amendment to the Articles of Incorporation. We also looked at 1701.57, which is our current statute on classified boards. Finally, in this section, we talked about the availability in Ohio for uh, companies to, or directors to conduct business, directors or shareholders, to conduct business via a written action without a meeting, as we called it. Um, that's 1701.54. Um, there are lots of instances in which it's cumbersome to convene, formally convene, a meeting of uh, directors or shareholders, and corporations frequently use this uh, mechanism to um, make a decision uh, in a, in a cost-effective and, and quick way. So we looked at 1701.54. Finally, in this area, we talked about the proper roles of officers. That's the second tier of management of a corporation. Remember, the directors appoint the officers. Going back, shareholders elect directors, directors appoint officers. Um, the fact that uh, officers are, again, these special purpose agents of the corporation we looked uh, at Ohio Revised Code 1701.64 for some guidance on the proper roles of officers as well as the provisions of the Code of Regulations which often uh, deal with uh, uh, giving some uh, detail to these, these roles as officers. Let's look at uh, management and control of the publicly held corporation and voting issues. Um, we talked about proxy regulation and proxy disclosure. Remember, this is the process by which a um, shareholder gives his or her vote to someone to vote for them. Typically, that shareholder is giving their vote to management to vote a certain way, primarily because the shareholder doesn't want to have to actually attend the shareholder meeting, which in the case of a public company can be any of a number of locations and can contain thousands of shareholders. Uh, hence the regulation of federal uh, of proxies of federally uh, registered shares. Um, 
This is governed by the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, and we looked at um, the 34 Act again. We talked about it earlier, but um, now we talked about um, when a company becomes subject to this uh, regulatory scheme. Um, once they've registered a, a, a class of shares under the 33 Act for sure, um, but also um, any issuer engaged in interstate commerce who has assets exceeding 10 million and a class of equity security held by uh, held by 2,000 persons or 500 who are not sophisticated or accredited investors. We spent time looking at proxy forms, proxy statements, and the annual report that accompanies the proxies. Remember, these typically go out in the context of an annual meeting. And so um, the shareholders are often receiving the proxy, which is the voting card, the uh, proxy statement, which is a statement describing the issues to be voted on via the proxy card, and the annual report, which is the annual the, the, the federally required annual report of the corporation regarding its financial results. Uh, we looked at the form of, the pro uh, again, for the proxy statement, the proxy rules, these are a series of regulations under um, Regulation 14 of the 1934 Act. Uh, these regulations are also called rules. And so we looked at Rule 14A4 for a form of proxy card. Um, we looked at a form of proxy statement in Rule 14A3 and A5. Um, we also talked about in detail a particularly important section of the proxy statement uh, called the management discussion and analysis. Um, this is where management is, in, is allowed to uh, discuss in narrative terms um, specifics regarding the results of operations, uh, the financial prospects of the corporation, financial state of affairs. Um, this is um, a, a provision that is uh, provide the detail, the detail for which is provided for in item 303 of regulation SK, which you remember are the SEC rules that provide detail for formatting some of these responses. Regulation SK item 303, the M, what we call the MDNA provision, Allows, corp allows corporations to also make certain uh, forward-looking statements about the prospects of the corporation, which are permissible as long as they are couched in the proper uh, warnings and the proper uh, precatory language um, that uh, lets the uh, reader know that uh, they are essentially educated guesses and nothing more. Uh, we talked, uh, for an example, of the MDNA disclosures. We looked at the Caterpillar case out of Brazil and the uh, instance where um, Caterpillar failed to properly um, disclose the fact that certain gains it had realized in the past due to currency exchange rates uh, were not going to be duplicated in the current year. And we saw the, the court um, exploring what the duty is <clears throat> to um, make uh, a complete and accurate disclosure of all of the material facts that are important to investors. This was our first exposure to the concept of materiality in the securities law uh, realm and uh, what it means. Um, we decided in the case of uh, TSC Industries versus Northway that um, a an omitted fact, in the case of omissions, an omitted fact is material if there's a substantially likelihood that the disclosure of the omitted fact would have been viewed by a reasonable investor as having a significantly um, altered impact on the total mixture of information made available. Um, in other words, material facts are those that a reasonable investor would deem important in making a decision to buy or sell that security. Uh, we then moved into false and misleading proxy statements. And the concept here is that there are uh, SEC rules under the proxy regulations, specifically F Rule 14A9, that um, requires that all statements made in a proxy statement be true uh, in, in, all, in all aspects, uh, again, to avoid a situation where um, management is misleading or lying to the shareholders in order to get their vote. Um, this is uh, our first glimpse at also um, 
rule rule 10b5 that's 10b-5 under the 34 act um, that uh, is the general anti-fraud provision that applies to all federal securities transactions next we looked at shareholder proposals under the proxy rules that's rule 14a8 and um, we talked about what is required for a shareholder to um, have a proposal included um, in a proxy statement that goes out to all shareholders. Um, there are certain uh, requirements that must be met. Um, they have to have owned a certain number of shares for a certain number of a certain amount of time. Um, the shareholder can't be a personal uh, issue that the shareholder only has. It has to be something of interest to all shareholders. And we saw the very major uh, exclusion for issues that are deemed to be um, management issues or within the purview of management and how that is a possibly a highly um, litigated area. Finally, we looked at Regulation FD, which is the ability for corporations to uh, make uh, disclosures um, uh, to put them through the SEC uh, process in the event that something material has to be disclosed in between the quarterly 10 Qs or the annual 10 Ks and how that is a way for a corporation to avoid being accused of selectively leaking material information to the marketplace. This week we talked about <clears throat> the uh, duty of care and the business judgment rule as it relates to directors who run these corporations. These are um, in some cases statutory uh, provisions, uh, but they are certainly common law concepts that carry through um, all of the laws, uh, all of the cases dealing with alleged director uh, malfeasance, misfeasance, um, bad, bad decision making. We looked at the uh, business judgment rule uh, in Litwin versus Allen, uh, the New York Supreme Court case from 1940. Uh, the business judgment rule is a presumption that directors are acting in good faith on an informed basis and when, make, when making decisions affecting the corporation. Um, it is a presumption. It can be rebutted. Um, we also uh, learned in the uh, Litwin case that um, directors are human. They're not perfect. Um, they're allowed to make mistakes. And that is what we talk about when we talk about the duty of care and being careful or careless. Essentially, corporation, corporate directors are um, held to a level of, of due care in making decisions. Um, but if they make a mistake, um, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that they have violated their fiduciary duty to directors. There are certain remedies that, 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 that apply, and that's what we talked about in this section. The upshot of the Schlensky versus Wrigley case we looked at was that um, if there is an alleged violation of, of, of duty of care, bad decision making, let's say, <clears throat> those decisions will be upheld unless it can be shown that the directors acted with fraud, illegality, or a conflict of interest in the decision making process. The Ohio standard is 170159B. Um, we also looked at 170159C, uh, which deals with the concept of duty of care by directors um, in Ohio. A concept that we learned about in the Van Smith versus Van Gorkum case is that <clears throat> there's a certain minimum amount of, of process that directors must undertake in order to be able to effectively argue that they were fully informed when making a decision. In other words, uh, the Smith Van Gorkum, Van Gorkum case says that um, you can't simply say that, oops, I made a mistake, if you didn't go through the right process to at least have the basic facts and basic information in hand to make that decision in a competent way. Smith, Van, uh, Smith versus uh, Van Gorkum uh, brings us the concept of uh, duty of care is a, is a process driven analysis and that the directors have to at least have gone through the process
of educating themselves adequately. In that case, the construed Delaware General Corporation Law, Section 141, issues of good faith were irrelevant. It really was the process of gathering information to arrive at an informed business judgment that was critical. Can directors know everything that goes on within, within a corporation? No, of course not. They have to, to a certain extent, um, assuming that they're uh, following the right process to be informed about their decision making, they, they have to, um, they, they should be allowed to rely on systems that they've put in place to monitor what goes on within the corporation. Uh, and that was the in re uh, Caremark for a derivative litigation case that we looked at. Um, essentially, um, in that case, um, where, a, where a board of directors um, receives information that it believes in good faith um, is adequate for it to make its decision, uh, where, it's, where it's getting advice from counsel, from outside advisors, um, and that is the type of process of due care we're talking about here. Um, and they've put systems in place, reasonable systems in place, um, to monitor this. Um, they ha they're not going to be held to do more uh, than that. Uh, they're entitled to, again, rely on uh, their systems, to rely on their business judgment in, in putting those systems in place. Um, and the courts will only go so far in finding liability uh, on the part of a board uh, under the due care analysis uh, when they've, they've taken steps to become informed and to implement monitoring systems. Finally, um, you should note that um, in these situations where we're talking about um, alleged violation of the duty of due care, uh, the due care prong of, of, of fiduciary duty, the issue has to be material. Uh, at least you should ask whether the issue is material to the overall business of the corporation. Uh, there can be uh, a lot of uh, noise made about uh, a director's failure to monitor something or a director's failure to uh, become fully informed about a particular issue, but the issue needs to be material. Uh, otherwise, everyone's wasting the, the resources of the corporation and even addressing it in, in any type of a lawsuit. Um, also, you'll recall <clears throat> in the first uh, Brem versus Eisner case, um, the analysis fo focused heavily on, on whether there was the exercise of informed business judgment. Uh, I say it's the same thing as informed duty of care, and was it breached? Um, and in, in a lot of these cases, as we've seen, sometimes we have evidentiary problems with the plaintiff's case. Um, they didn't plead waste adequately. Um, there was no allegation of uh, an exchange that was so one-sided that no reasonable person could uh, consider that to have been any kind of a fair deal. Um, but again, it, it harkens back to uh, duty of care analysis is process driven. The Bremer 2 case um, <clears throat> spent a little more time um, talking about this this uh, duty of loyalty issue that's the subject of this particular lecture. Um, and again, came back to that provision that we saw in some of the earlier cases that um, if directors act with due care, that is informed or in proper reliance on knowledgeable experts and not in bad faith, these decisions will be upheld generally. And, and this, this I, I would submit that this concept of good faith um, is, is a, a part of this, this duty of loyalty prong of fiduciary duty that we're talking about now. Then we looked at the Weinberger versus UOP case, which was a pretty clear cut um, case construing the director duty of loyalty, uh, where we had, remember, directors uh, that were directors of both Signal as well as UOP. They found out about a, uh, a study that came up with a 
fair offering price to buy the shares of, of the one company. Um, they did not share it with the other board, and as a result, the, um, the, the company that was being acquired accepted less than they might have accepted otherwise. And this was a fairly straightforward case that had a lot of facts, but all led to the idea that uh, these directors had a, uh, a, an absolute uh, fiduciary duty of loyalty to the shareholders of the company on whose board they sat. And the, co the court says, there is no safe harbor for divided loyalties in Delaware. When directors of a Delaware corporation are on both sides of a transaction, they're required to demonstrate their utmost good faith and most scrupulous inherent fairness of the bargain. And the court cited from the Levian versus Sinclair case that we looked at earlier. Um, the last case we looked in this area was uh, dealing with corporate opportunity. Um, you know, corporations have physical assets. They also have assets that consist of opportunities in the future of things they're going to do or would like to do. And this was the Northeast Harbor Golf Club versus Harris case uh, where we had uh, the court generally trying to come up with what is a corporate opportunity. Uh, and uh, we don't have statute in Ohio on that. Uh, and in that jurisdiction, there wasn't a statute either. Um, so we saw the court uh, trying to come up with when is it fair to uh, consider an opportunity to be owned by the corporation such that the director has violated uh, his duty of loyalty by um, uh, taking that, op that, op that opportunity to his or her own uh, uh, interest. And we saw in this case the court adopting ALI uh, 5.05, uh, which is the uh, model rule construing uh, the idea of uh, what, I what is a, uh, a business opportunity. Um, in the end, in the end, uh, this came down to the fact that the director at issue hadn't really disclosed to the board uh, that she owned this property, um, that she was considering developing it, and the court says essentially, uh, the central feature of the ALI test is the strict requirement of full disclosure prior to taking advantage of any corporate opportunity. Uh, and had that been the case here, um, the board might have made an informed decision as to what to do about the behavior of one of its directors. Um, so that wrapped up the section uh, for on the second prong of fiduciary duty, that is loyalty, conflict of interest, and misappropriation of corporate opportunities. Next, we spent time talking about shareholder derivative actions, uh, especially since so many of the cases that we've looked at um, deal with shareholder derivative actions which is understandable since shareholder derivative actions really um, bring into uh, focus the uh, very clear lines uh, uh, between the corporation itself, the corporation's shareholders themselves, uh, the corporation's actors, that is its directors and officers, in a way that is um, unique and is a perfect vehicle for looking at all the things that we've talked about in this course. Uh, thus, we had a, a, a whole chapter on the shareholder derivative actions. Uh, we distinguished between what's a, dire a direct lawsuit and what's a derivative suit. A direct suit is a suit by a shareholder um, against the corporation to enforce a right that is probably unique to that particular shareholder, um, as opposed to a derivative action in which the plaintiff is asserting rights um, of this shareholder and all similarly situated shareholders um, to induce the corporation to take action that it is, for some reason or another, hasn't taken yet. And oftentimes that action involves um, suing a corporate actor within that corporation, that is, the director. Um, when you bring a derivative action, you're, you're suing the corporation to do something it shouldn't have done something it should have done or shouldn't have done through the uh, actions of its director or officer. And we went through a series of examples that spelled out when something is direct, when something is derivative. Um, I think everyone understood that pretty clearly. Uh, we also um, started to uh, talk about um, some of the uh, ramifications of whether there's a direct lawsuit or a derivative lawsuit. For instance, um, the proceeds of a direct lawsuit go to the shareholder. 
who brought the lawsuit. The proceeds of a derivative action go to the corporation because it's the corporation that, it, that uh, should have taken the action against the, the, the wrongdoer. So that has a, an important impact. Um, in a direct action, parties typically pay their own legal fees. In a derivative action, there is the potential for the court to award legal fees to the plaintiff who initiated the, law, the lawsuit in the first place under the theory that um, this person should be, should be compensated by the corporation for recovering something that went to the benefit of the corporation. Um, and we will look at that, that is state by state in terms of that procedure. Um, in Ohio, we, in the, in, 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 let me back up, um, the, the shareholder derivative procedure is state by state. Um, we looked at the MBCA provisions 7.40 to 7.47, um, but in Ohio, it's not a statute, it's a, it's a, a civil rule of procedure, specifically Rule 23.1. Um, and we looked at that rule in detail and boiled it down to some very specific subparts. For instance, the plaintiff has to have been a shareholder at the time of the action of which he is complaining. Uh, he can't have become a shareholder later. The shareholder has to fairly and adequately represent the interests of all other similarly situated shareholders. Just like with any class action lawsuit, um, there has to be that um, ability to be a fair representative of other shareholders. Um, the shareholder has to prove um, and allege with particularity uh, the shareholder's efforts to obtain the action that he's asking for from the directors. And if he doesn't ask for that remedy directly from the directors, he has to explain why he did not ask them to do this directly. Why? Because um, corporations uh, as we know, are entitled to operate under the presumption of the business judgment rule, shouldn't be uh, forced to respond to every uh, request or demand by a shareholder to do something. Uh, and so therefore, the law, uh, to a certain extent, um, gives, uh, gives some credence to the overall class action rules, but also gives a nod to the business judgment rule um, in requiring that the, the plaintiff first make a demand on the on the directors so they can address it uh, without the requirement of litigation thereby saving the corporation lots and lots of money um, the ohio rule 23.1 is silent on the issue of legal fees it's not covered at all that way that means it's 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 developed through through interpretation of, of the of the rule and through other equitable common law concepts um, MBCA 7.46 does deal with um, the award of legal fees, although it's, it's permissive, it says that they may be awarded, but at least it addresses it in some way, shape, or form. And if you practice in a, in a jurisdiction that's adopted um, MBCA type of, uh, of enactments, you, may mind, you might find that you have a nice uh, piece of ammunition because um, the, the possibility of legal fees is expressly provided for by statute. We talked about the fact that most corporations typically form a, um, a litigation committee or some type of body to evaluate the, uh, the value of the demand, the, the, the ver veracity of the demand. And of, of course, that needs to be made up of directors who are not uh, implicated in the complaint that the plaintiff is making. And these are what we would call in this context disinterested directors. Uh, they, they are completely neutral, except for the fact that they sit on the board. Uh, they're, they're relatively neutral in terms of the allegations uh, that are made by the, uh, the plaintiff. We also talked about the fact that the litigation committee um, can be a little bit of a defensive device in that it uh, puts some delay into the process. Plaintiffs don't like delay. Um, we also looked about the looked at um, the fact that um, when making the decision to pursue a a a, plaint, a plaintiff's complaint to, to, to initiate action as a derivative plaintiff, um, the board of directors um, still has a certain amount of business judgment that's allowed that's allowed to 
um, rely upon in making that decision because um, whether the plaintiff's uh, allegation is, is worthy, uh, it has to do with um, what impact it might have on the business. And of course, this is what directors are best at deciding. Also, initiating or pursuing a, plaintiff, uh, a plaintiff's derivative action is an expensive and time-consuming process, which again, may not be financially in the best interest of the corporation. So we see the court um, illustrated in the Zapata case, repeating the fact that even this decision as to whether to act on a plaintiff, a plaint derivative plaintiff's um, allegations is a matter of business judgment to be exercised by the board. The other concept that we've, we've come across here is when is the requirement of a demand on the board excused? Um, this is what we call demand futility. In what situations will the court waive the requirement that the shareholder make a demand upon the directors? Um, and we looked at court, we looked at cases where um, the the court construed that that situation and came up with this rule. In justifying not asking the, the corporation to pursue the derivative claims, the plaintiff has to provide some particularized rationale to the court as to why he or she did, didn't ask the directors directly. The fact that they're directors alone is not sufficient. We've seen that. Um, the fact that they may be receive compensation from the corporation is not enough. We've seen that. Um, the fact that a director may be directly implicated in the allegations, that might be something that a, a court would consider um, a uh, sufficiently articulated reason for not uh, making the demand upon the board. The board's, uh, the board's denial of, of a, a demand to proceed against in a, in a derivative fashion um, is governed by the business judgment rule. Absent a showing of some sort of a taint or, or bias or, or personal involvement of the directors. Um, so uh, again, business judgment rule governs the, the, the demand when it's turned down. When the demand is, is excused, let's say, because they feel that the court feels that there was a justifiable um, uh, waiver of that requirement, even in that situation, the courts hold that the directors still have um, the ability to employ their business judgment to ask the court to dismiss the lawsuit uh, as having been uh, uh, ill-conceived and not in the best interests of the corporation, again, under the business judgment rule. Um, the business judgment rule is going to govern either the, the uh, demand refused or the demand excused scenario as long as the board uh, is not motivated by some type of a personal bias or, or, or taint uh, that, would, that would affect that decision. This lesson talks about dissension in the closely held corporation. Uh, we're looking at chapter 13 of the text. <clears throat> Many corporations are formed on a 50-50 ownership basis uh, for a variety of reasons that we talked about in the lesson. This also always creates the possibility for deadlock. Um, the first case we looked at in this area was the uh, Gearing versus Kelly case uh, in which we had uh, a situation where a director who resigned midterm needed to be replaced. Uh, we had one uh, one director who uh, decided not to show up for the vote to repl to replace the uh, one director, and then sought to uh, negate the vote by going to court. In this case, we had Section 25 of the New York General Corporation Law, which allowed the court to get involved where justice may require. Um, in this case, the court refused to uh, utilize that mechanism to effect what was a legitimate election of a replacement director, but for the unclean hands of the director that didn't show up. Um, in this case, we have a court um, trying to avoid uh, getting involved in the internal 
corporate governance of a corporation where there are adequate mechanisms either in the bylaws or in st state law to resolve the situation uh, and where one of the shareholders has chosen to s sabotage the, the proceedings. Um, the lesson here being um, uh, courts will sometimes uh, decline the opportunity to exercise judicial activism to resolve a 50-50 dispute that could be resolved otherwise. In Ohio, we have 1701.58F that uh, allows for the replacement of a uh, director by the remaining directors, even if less than a majority. Um, and um, again, remember, keep in mind that um, this is for an interim director because there's always an annual election of, of directors that comes up every year. And so this really is, is a stopgap measure uh, intended to deal with uh, what happens in the interim. You remember 170158 was the statute that talks about uh, uh, directors generally and some of their other uh, responsibilities uh, in connection with the corporation. Similarly, in the, um, the case of Inre um, Radom and, and Nierdorf, we had, uh, Nierdorf, we had uh, a familial dispute, which a lot of these are, they're family disputes. Um, and the one disgruntled party files for judi judicial dissolution uh, under Section 103 of the New York General Corporation Law, citing deadlock. Uh, this is a case where the corporation was profitable. Um, they were fairly successful. Um, they just had a lot of uh, bad blood between the owners. Um, in this case, the, the court came down with the rule that the prime inquiry, at least for this court, in getting involved in re resolving a, a shareholder deadlock is uh, to look at whether the solution um, is beneficial to the shareholders and not detrimental to the public. In this case, it wouldn't necessarily have been beneficial to the shareholders because the corporation was profitable. Uh, the shareholders were making money. Uh, might it have been detrimental to uh, the public? Possibly. And in this case, that would mean employees, vendors, uh, others who are affected by the corporation, um, since dissolution of a corporation is a rather extreme event that has a ripple effect through a lot of different uh, people and, and situations. Um, and just a quick aside, uh, we do have 1701.91, which are the Ohio rule on, on dissolution. Uh, we looked at some um, contractual deadlock mechanisms. Again, with close corporations, we've seen cases uh, and, and, and the statute which encouraged the parties to document their corporate governance provisions in a contract. Um, there are a number of ways to contractually provide for the resolution of a deadlock. One is the third party decision maker provision. Another one is an arbitration clause. Uh, a, th a fourth, third one is the Russian roulette solution. And then of course there can be a liquidation provision in the event of deadlock. Um, next we looked at shareholder oppression this is a situation where a majority shareholder is exercising uh, not only their corporate governance rights um, as a majority shareholder, but perhaps possibly also uh, reaching beyond that to um, assert pressure on the minority shareholder uh, for a number of reasons, um, usually to force the minority shareholder to sell at a discounted rate uh, and or otherwise um, get rid of their position uh, to, the benefit, to the benefit of the majority shareholder. Um, in the Donahue versus Rod Electra type case, um, this is where we you get the um, description of some of these freeze-out mechanisms, but we also have the court saying for the first time, hearkening back to a Meinhard versus Salmon, that um, majority shareholders have a certain fiduciary duty to minority shareholders uh, because of their inherent power and their ability to uh, force any decision uh, down the throat of the minority shareholder. Um, this court uh, uh, stands for the principle that that's not, if you have a majority share, if you may have majority power, it doesn't mean you can do anything you want. Uh, majority shareholders have a fiduciary duty to minority shareholders. And not even going that far, this court held that in a closely held corporation, any stockholder owes a fiduciary duty to the other stockholders um, as, as essentially equivalent to being partners. Okay. Um, we looked at some of the remedies for dissension, and this gets back to 
a similar discussion of judicial intervention to establish um, resolution of deadlock situations. The Davis versus Sheeran case out of Texas in 1988 um, involved an attempt by a um, minority shareholder to uh, force a buyout uh, by initiating legal action uh, to get the court to uh, force a buyout of the majority, uh, buyout, buyout of the minority shareholder. Um, here the court uh, points out the fact that, um, well, courts do have a general equity power to fashion uh, buyout remedies. Um, this is an extreme uh, solution in, in most instances. Contrasted to the prior case, here we have a court um, reaching, I would submit, to fashion a buyout remedy um, uh, to achieve equity for the minority shareholder. Ohio has a judicial dissolution statute, 1701.91. Uh, in that case, in an action brought by one half of the directors when there is an even number of directors, or by the holders of shares entitling them to exercise at least two-thirds of the voting power, when it's established that the corporation has an even number of directors who are deadlocked in the management of the corporate affairs, whatever that means, and the shareholders are unable to break a deadlock. Um, unclear as to what it means to have management deadlocked in the management of the corporate affairs. Um, this statute um, doesn't necessarily give the uh, broad equitable powers that the court had in the uh, Davis versus Sheeran case. Another statutory approach is uh, MBCA 14.30, similar to the Ohio statute, but in this case, it adds um, one of the triggers for asking for judicial, dis judicial dissolution um, is instances of corporate waste. Um, that's a fairly significant addition to what would apply in Ohio. Uh, you should be aware of that statute, depending on where you practice. Valuation of privately held corporation stock is the last topic we cover in this area. Um, if there's a negotiated buyout, if there's an ordered buyout, in the end, how do you value a private company? Um, we looked at a number of mechanisms for that. One is the agreed value approach that again makes its way into a shareholder agreement. Uh, we looked at the book or asset value approach. We also looked at the income or earnings approach, which um, takes a multiple of the trailing four or five years average earnings. Uh, we looked at the dividend approach, which again tries to predict the dividend paying ability of the corporation going forward based on historical dividend or profit distribution practices. And finally, we touched on the market approach where a third party comes in and comes up with the fair market value of the entity for purposes of valuing the shares. All of these being required uh, by virtue of the fact that private companies have no ready trading market. That is the end of the first half summary of corporations.